When we are doing the will of our true self, we are inevitably doing the will of the universe. In magic, these are seen as indistinguishable. That every human soul is in fact one you. So come on, down the face is one. Yes, we want it. Be wary of the creeping tongue that says that they own it. Shade is made when the gods fade a secret moment. Contradiction is the face of man. What you're hearing is Arwen, a folk mantic, audio mantic, sonic hymnal by my guest today, Tom Whiston. This has to be one of my favorite discussions as we transdimensionally surf the confluences of analog and digital artistic conjurations, our communion within this digital sphere, the systemic and sometimes political underpinnings of academia or magical currents, and his magnificent body of work that both exercises and informs his anarchic magical praxis. Listeners will know this track as the Ouroboros, the opening and closing of We the Hallowed's recent collective audio sigil, Detritus. I'm excited that listeners will get to hear the wonderful folkloric tale interwoven into this transcendent work amongst our weave and terries across many pertinent subjects. Patreon supporters will have already been privy to our raw chat, but it was my mission to resurge my love of the audio podcast format with this guest, editing and constructing a return to form that hopefully emanates my love for Tom's works. You can subscribe to Pragmagic via Patreon for raw, uncut conversations, unreleased audiomantic works, Patreon-only liminal streams, and writings at patreon.com slash pragmagic. I also wanted to say that I have begun a new project of daily live streaming on YouTube and Twitch to both X-Hex and Vex self-image dysmorphia into a tool to commune and document my mental health, magical praxis, and various projects. Links for YouTube and Twitch are in the show notes available at wethehallowed.org. Without further ado, slither hither, weirdos and witches, here's my fantastic conversation with Seer and audio mage, Tom Whiston. So at the moment I'm I'm doing my PhD um, quite late. I mean, like I took quite a long break after I did my masters and went and got a job and <laughs> lived in different countries and did a load of stuff. Uh, yeah, um, and then came back to do my PhD. Um, and my PhD basically is about how kind of music and magic intersect, um, and especially how they relate to like society on the whole and the kind of um, technology in society and how maybe kind of magic um, practices and kind of thinking is maybe a kind of antidote to the kind of overly technological um, way that society is going. Um, so, yeah. yeah, my I mean, I work in IT outside of doing music stuff. So I'm really exposed to like a lot of uh, stuff that's going on in that space and, and the technology there. Um, and, and I'm, although kind of deep, deeply into IT topics, um, I'm also very sceptical um, of the kind of idea that like technology will will save us or that, you know, that we should just always be looking for the next kind of technological solution. Yeah. Um, 
and and I I kind of agree um, with uh, Heidegger when he talks about technology, where he's saying that technology is uh, like an inframing device. Technology isn't like a computer or something. It's like a way of thinking about the world. Mm -hmm. um, and that once you start thinking technologically, everything only has value as in use for something else. And I think that that devalues like the world and nature and it devalues art and those things as well and i think it's why there's more of that feeling of like yeah you know, everything's been done before there's kind of nothing right. new under the sun anymore yeah. because we see those kind of art and culture things as a means of like selling a product or doing something in the kind of capitalist world um and i'm really against that and i want to fight against it seems to me like most of the the artists who are using a cult kind of symbolism and thinking in those ways um they're the people who are pushing back against those ideas mostly and saying there's another way you can kind of live and be and interact with the world um so it seems yeah. like it's kind of ripe to to talk about how those things intersect one thing that's always fascinated me about my own struggles or tarries within audiomancy and that audiomantic process is the confluence of both analog and digital creations. In my own praxis, I am a bit anal about creating my own analog samples if I was to ever sequence them digitally. And I often wonder for other audiomancers such as Tom what their process is like and how they have resolved this confluence of analog and digital so i mean when i first started i mean i i made music for a really long time right so i started yeah. playing guitar when i was like six years old and i've basically done music ever since then um my undergraduate degree and my master's in music i always worked in music until i kind of switched to it a bit later in life um music was always the thing i was into and I kind of started with guitar and then I got into really using computers. Um, so I mean, I'm like 37 now. So I was <laughs> around when, you know, the kind of internet really took off and became a thing and it became yeah. possible to use computers really for, for music. Um, and I got super into that for years and I was making music that was really made on a computer. You know, everything was programmed really carefully and, and with mm -hmm. a mouse. And I got to a point where I was like, this feels like a job now <laughs> like I'm in front of the computer typing yeah. all day you know moving the mouse and then I you know make some music and I'm doing the same thing and it, it it felt like I was I was just kind of working a job um and I started thinking well how can I be more analog about these things how can I get back to to kind of the way I used to do things which is pick up an instrument and, and write a song and and you know see what kind of comes in the moment rather than get really obsessive about is that snare at exactly the right, right point you know should i move it one microsecond to the left or yeah, right? more of a human yeah know, exactly. integration yeah exactly so um i bought loads of modular synth gear and got some guitars back and uh got some other stuff and, and stopped doing stuff in the box basically i kind of yeah. told myself i'm going to limit myself the computer is like a recording and mixing device Exactly. But the creation of music is outside and my hands need to be on the thing in a, you know, a physical Amen. way. Yeah. Um, so over the last, like, I don't know, five or six years, maybe even longer than that now, maybe it's even like 10 years now, I really was like, I'm going to work physically with stuff. And I make basically everything myself. So this communion with the digital sphere, especially within artistic processes, is kind of in need of a marriage of both the tactile application, being able to touch, being able to produce yourself in this somatic reality, but also marrying what the computer can do. And I've always struggled with this communion, but I had never considered what we might be imparting on these machines and the machine learning itself. The danger of like pushing too much stuff onto computers, in, especially in society, I mean, the, this is beyond kind of music production now, no, but in, yeah. in, in society, if you start to say, you know, we're gonna use machine learning and things to choose, you know, who should get to the next stage of an application for a job 
where should we police in the city based on some AI algorithm? What you're really doing is encoding your existing prejudice into those machines because they work yeah. off the data sets we have and those data sets are prejudiced. And those machines are like a black box. So you yeah. can kind of say, oh, I've got no idea. The algorithm does what it does. That's what happened. If there was bias, it's not my fault. No. Right. And, and, it, and it's a, in a way, it, it, it's a way that will keep people who are marginalized marginalized through the use of those things that have all this shitty bias from years that we kind of drag into them. That there are people who are really using AI to make music kind of from scratch or from an idea. So they give me 20 different versions of this AI and then I'll pick the one I like and I will um, then iterate on it or not, right. you know, depending. I see the beauty in that from like a chaos randomization. It's not random though. That's the thing. You're right. The yeah. kind of prejudices that you choose. And I mean, so are you, right? right. Because you've listened <laughs> to all of that music. Yeah, genetics right. and you know, the, your cultural history. Yeah, right? yeah. You, but you have the ability that machines don't yet at least have, which is a step beyond that, to synthesize those things into something really wholly new, rather than just a kind of very clever pastiche of the things that you fed it in with. Sure. And I, I kind of worry that if we go down that route where a lot of the underlying stuff is kind of somehow done with, with AI um, or machine learning, that we really do stagnate in those kind of terms of new ideas because you just can't make that extra leap. And I mean, for me, what I'm really interested in in music is kind of being a conduit for something beyond myself. I want to be able to like be at an instrument and drop the kind of ego and get out of my mind and let the kind of thing flow through me. And, you know, the kind of ideal state, I think, is like if you're playing guitar or something and you can hear what needs to come next, just that microsecond before you're going to play it. Right. So the, the pattern is <laughs> coming into your head and you have to kind of translate it onto the, the fretboard or something. So moving beyond the artistic process and more into the magical praxis of marrying these things, one of the things I debate within myself is the strength of the digital applications like ones that create sigils for you, ones that take a lot of the processes out of the you know, journey into the creation of such things, whether it's a sigil app or a cut-up generator. And I'm not an absolutist, I don't think they don't have any merit, but it's one that I struggle because I feel there's a lot missing within the process itself. I mean, yeah. there's, there's something about, with sigils, like there's something about putting the time into taking that thing and turning it into the, the other thing, which is really important to the process. Yeah. I mean, I, I can understand like using a computer to make a sigil based on magic squares or something because that's not a kind of artistic synthesis process. It's like you have a square with numbers, the letters map to the number, you draw a thing. I mean, that's right, an algorithm, right. right? So fine if you use a computer for that. Mm -hmm. But I think for me, those sigils don't really do that much for me. So the whole point is kind of burning it into your mind and going through the rough and tumble of creating it is how it does that. Do you have uh, certain practices or what I term audiomancy, ritualistic things to kind of conjure? It all kind of depends on the project. I mean, I, I have a kind of approach to my work where the pieces are often very conceptual in that I have a real strong kind of idea about what I want to um, say with the piece or what idea I want to explore. But I purposefully try to keep my mind empty about how I'm going to explore that. So I will think a lot about the piece and say, you know, I want it to be about this thing. I want to like express this certain feeling or certain idea, but I don't sit down and go, and that means, you know, I need to use this scale and I need to start like this and it needs to go like this. I prefer to kind of overthink the concept and then sit down as a kind of blank and, and see what comes comes through me often it takes you somewhere really different to where you maybe imagined it in mind but if you then st start to force it back into that thing that kind of rough idea you maybe had you lose the kind of magic of the thing so you have to kind of learn to go with the flow of the piece the audio sigil um piece 
that I collaborated uh, with you on this is a good example of that. Because I mean, that has a really specific intent. Um, it's like a, a piece which is really um, about uh, Caridwen, the, the kind of Welsh witch goddess, mm -hmm. um, and a kind of uh, a piece which is kind of honouring her and asking uh, for a kind of blessing from her. So the kind of song mantra you can hear in it is um, a sigil where the letters of the statement of intent are, are mixed up into a kind of non, you know, oh, beautiful linguistic thing. I actually have had it in my head ever yeah. since working uh, on it. You know, I listen to that piece a lot, and it, it definitely sits with me. I've carried that working with me. Not, not a bad one to take with you, because the whole idea yeah. is, is about... Um, the whole point of my working with Sarah Jim really was about... Um, she is the kind of keeper of Arwen, which is inspiration in the kind of classic Celtic um, kind of mythologies. And all the kind of... Um, the most famous bard in Welsh mythic history, uh, Taliesin, um, got his gift through Seridwen. There's this whole thing about uh, uh, that she made a potion in her cauldron for her son, um, who was, um, I, I don't know how you pronounce the name in Welsh, I'm afraid, which is terrible because I'm half Welsh, I should know that. <laughs> um, but, but the son was uh, meant to be really ugly, and, and the name means darkness in Welsh. Um, but so she said, you know, for him to get ahead in life, I need to give him something else. So she made this potion, which you have to brew for a year and a day and put these herbs in every day and tend to it um, so that he would have all this kind of inspiration and knowledge. Mm. And, and the idea was what happened was at the end of the year that the guy who she kind of hired to stir the potion, um, it, the, the bit of the potion which had the magical effect came out of the cauldron and landed on his thumb and he sucks his thumb gets all the powers that were meant for her son and it starts this whole kind of chase thing between him and her um <laughs> which which results in them kind of transmutating into lots of different animals and in the end she eats him when he's a piece of corn and she's like a chicken um and then becomes pregnant and then gives birth to him um and when she gives birth to him she decides he's kind of so fair that she will let him live um, and, and he goes on to become the kind of bard which inspired all of bardic history in, in mm -hmm. uh, Celtic mythology. Um, I'm not someone who's like super trained in like traditional ways of, of magic. I yeah, have to say me that. I mean, <laughs> my, I mean, it's interesting because I've always been really interested in, in magic. Um, even as a kid, it was something I was super interested in. Um, but through my kind of general life and experiences and those things, I always kind of, I never got too into kind of Wicca. It was a bit too, especially the way it is in the UK. It's a bit too kind of fluffy for my taste. Yeah. Um, I have fairly like kind of dark taste in art and cinema and those things. The the, yeah. the stuff that goes a bit too kind of on like to the kind of hippie side, maybe sometimes doesn't kind of resonate with me. I need something which is a bit kind of broader spectrum. For a long time, I, I did a lot of kind of chaos magic stuff and got really into those um, those things. Yeah, in I would end, almost kind of consider what chaos mm -hmm. has become a current of you know the UK. Mm -hmm, I mean, for sure, you know for what sure. I mean? I think it's but, in the Pantheon now. For sure. But I mean, yeah. in the end, I, I became kind of disillusioned with that as well. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, there's something about the idea of, like, results-based magic. Yeah. Which is inherently capitalist. Yes, yeah. Like, the part of chaos magic that speaks to me is the chaos, right? I'm, yeah. I'm, at heart, kind of politically, I'm pretty much like an anarchist. Yeah. Um, so the kind of anarchy of that of that chaos and the potential of that chaos is something that really speaks to me. Um, yeah. But the focus on like, you know, what's a tangible result? What's results based magic about? I mean, that's that somehow didn't kind of sit with me well after a time. Um, 
And yeah, probably even even more so the more time I spent with the IoT. Um, oh, you, you were in the Illuminate? Um, well, I started, yeah. I was going to join. Um, and at the point mm. where I finished the kind of adaptship and could have had the... Um, could have had the kind of uh, full uh, going into it. I decided not to, um, because yeah. what I found from from attending things a lot with them um, was really that they had a set group of things that they were always speaking to. So the same saints, the same processes, the same things, and that kind of hunger for results sometimes led me to feel maybe that was a, like. There was maybe a little bit of delusion there, do you know what I mean? That you would kind of say, you know, do a ritual for something really big, oh. you know, so some kind of, you know, real kind of world changing thing, you know, that we stop using oil or something like that, right? And yeah. then you see in a in the paper a, a article that says, you know, we used 0.001% less oil last year or something. And, and some of the people in, in that circle are like, well, that proves my magic works. <laughs> like I'm yes. a powerful yeah. magician from that. And, and and again, that kind of sat wrong with me. I felt like, I don't know about that. It feels a bit like, you know, you're justifying <laughs> that you're yeah. a magician through this kind yeah. of outside stuff, which you're not really controlling anyway. For me, magic is a lot about hollows of practice, too. And it is it is kind of an oxymoron to have a prerequisite for chaos that you're going to get results from chaos, you know? <laughs> yeah, 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 totally, yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah, I mean, if that's the yeah, the if the power is that you can control the chaos or something, sure. Yeah, yeah. Good, good luck with that. Team <laughs> Quran's on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I've talked to Phil Hine about it too, and you know, he's one of the progenitors of chaos magic, and he's had the same walloping kind of dismissal of it, and then kind of came back to it, and as all magic and creation should be. Anytime there's a kind of a label or a dogma or a system, I I kind of shy away from it. Totally. Yeah. Kind of after the chaos stuff, I was like, well, what do I look at now? You know, like I'm still into magic. I'm still really interested in that. The magic I'm interested in, I think, is more about changing myself. I think you change the world through changing Absolutely. yourself. Yeah. Um, so I was like, well, where do I look now? And I think the last couple of years, I've been really interested in like sabbatic witchcraft. Mm -hmm. the, um, and especially the kind of Andrew Chumbley stuff. I mean, I really like his stuff. I mean, once you can get over the um, barrier of being able to afford a copy of any of the books that he uh, put out, which is pretty brutal. Uh, yeah. I, I think if you're interested in the intersection of like art and magic, yeah, he's a brilliant person to be into because he is interested in that intersection. I mean, sometimes very, very overtly, right? I mean, there's right. the, the ritual of the like the hands and the eye about kind of your hand becoming possessed, and you can uh, and then you draw something kind of automatic drawing that spare sure. yeah. style stuff. Um, but all of his work, the way it comes together, um, speaks to me of like art. I mean, the Azawirt here in a lot of ways is a very artistic kind of statement about magic. Um, yeah. It's very non-literal. It's very open to be interpreted. It's got very kind of artistic language. Um, it's very open to kind of personal uh, interpretation, I think, anyway. Um, and from speaking well, to other practitioners, I think uh, the ones I spoke to would, would agree, I think. I believe a lot of metaphysically minded artistic practitioners, such as myself, fall into this barrel of needing to explain themselves and their works profusely. I know I get really excited to learn and research the different intrinsic values of the intentions within each metaphysically minded work. Perhaps this is a bad practice. Yeah, I, I feel like you always want the work to stand on its own. Like it shouldn't require a piece of writing for people right. to get it like that that's my kind of you know bugbear with a lot of kind of very postmodern stuff i feel sure. like if i need to kind of read an essay to get anything from this <laughs> then it, it doesn't really work for me yeah perhaps um, like it first and then hey here's exactly, an essay about yeah, it yeah. yeah yeah and then let's dig in deeper in, into this yeah. and see if what i felt was what the artist was or you know if it goes somewhere else um i mean the the problem for me to be honest is, is time um yes. time and energy yeah with stuff um i 
have a fairly demanding job and I'm doing a PhD. Last oh, year I was no, also I working in a job, um, trying to make music stuff. Um, and I've got chronic fatigue as well. So if I overextend myself, I crash yeah. really badly for like a long time and I have to be really careful about my energy levels. As most of you know, one of the biggest purposes of this podcast, of this current of Prag Magic, is for me to, well, as a perennial student, to learn and discern the different mental health and individuations of self from all these wonderful creators. Someone like Tom, who has these major undertakings, whether it be his PhD work, his demanding job, the completely intentful and thoroughly dynamic artistic processes he has. How, how is that translating? How does he keep this energy? What's he feel like most of the time? It, it, it's a hard one. I mean, the, the stuff that I would say affects me more mentally is not working on art projects or, or things like that. I mean, the PhD can be hard because you have to digest a lot of... Um, like quite hard writing and synthesize mm -hmm. it into something else and do it in this very kind of rigid academic framework um, and talking about things like magic that can be quite difficult sometimes. So that's a challenge. Um, but actually I find that the thing which is kind of the, the energy destroyer for me is like, is, is work, work, you know, pay, pay the bills and pay the rent kind of work um, because it's, um, living in inside of a system which i don't uh like or want to take part in ideally i mean the like you know for a long time i had really no decent job and was just making music and living on on kind of as little money as possible right um and i mean those yeah uh, uh, points where i kind of lived in the, the worst places in the world or like had no nowhere to live for a while. And I mean, that was cool in some ways because it allowed me to like move to Germany for a while. And that's where I met my wife and stuff. So, I mean, that was great. Um, and then I was freelancing for ages. And, and then I got offered a job um, and, and to move to Switzerland. And I, I was in Switzerland like for three, four years. Um, oh, wow. About two years ago. Um, so I moved around a bit, but there I ended up really working in a company, um, kind of going through that company, you know, uh, as you do, like changing role and, and and kind of, you know, moving from from programming to managing to, you know, kind of being in the like real leadership of the company and stuff. Sure. Um, and that was really interesting because I kind of proved to myself, well, I can work in that world and I can I can kind of succeed in it. Um mm -hmm. But I also proved to myself what I knew before, which is that I kind of hate the whole world. Um, yeah. And it's not it's not where my my interest lies. At least you so did I, it and figured it out instead of you sure, know, still striving mean, for it and then finding yeah, out that this yeah. isn't for you. you know? <laughs> but, I feel like I mean, that's always my problem. <laughs> I, I feel like I knew it wasn't for me before, though, so maybe I shouldn't oh, have done yeah. it. You know, yeah. <laughs> it, it bought me some nice synth equipment. Um, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> I can but, see a bunch of patch bays yeah, and everything yeah. behind you. Yeah, yeah right cool. behind is just a small amount of eye modular gear. Yeah, you know, about three times as much of that, and then some effects units and synths and stuff. But that's um, awesome. Yeah, yeah, but but I mean, it it was interesting because obviously when you get into that stuff, if you care about the work you do, whatever the work is, you put a lot of energy and time into that, and especially if you are in a role where you have to lead other people. You put a lot of energy into doing that the right way, making sure those people are well cared for. You right. know, I really believe exactly. And I believe like if you're a kind of manager or something where you're working, your responsibility is to make the team that you're a manager for have the best yes. possible work life possible. Right. Like servant leadership. You do what mm -hmm. they need for them to be able to work in the most you know, beneficial way to them possible so hopefully preserving their mental and physical well-being through your yeah. your job um rather than it being a kind of power trip um but that's exhausting in a space that you don't really love or where you have a lot of battles to fight um and because i try to put a lot a lot into the stuff that i do i try to go into things fully um then sometimes maybe it's hard to see that it's burning you out until it does 
Um, and then you have to work out how to recover from that. And that's quite difficult. Um, that's definitely something that's been a struggle for me in terms of kind of mental health. I realized I got to a point where I'd normalized being really exhausted all the time. Kind of yeah. my, all my holidays were just like recovering from work. <laughs> and like just kind of, yeah. you know, <laughs> laid out in bed, like thinking, oh, I'm just exhausted. And then just about the point when you've got some energy, you're, you know, you're back in at work again. Um, until one day you can't do that anymore because your you know body your mind just says what the hell are you doing you know right. and you've got to work out how to come back from that and that's a challenge and again that's a challenge made by the system we, we live in and speaking of the system that we live in tom as he had touched on earlier within his phd work has brought to my attention this rumination this meditation about sort of the systemic or intrinsic values of the magical currents we use themselves and how they inform or relate to our societal norms or academia at large. Academia is not super open to ideas of magic. No. So quite a, <laughs> uh, quite a lot of what you end up doing is saying, how can I talk about this in a way which is acceptable to people? But that in itself is a danger when you're talking about magic, right? Because it makes you start to think, well, I need to kind of sanitize some of this, or I need to kind of not talk about the true thing of what it is, to put it in a way that, you know, the establishment is is, is happy to read about it in. Um, but that's, the power of magic doesn't lie in it, um, kind of kowtowing to the establishment, right? It's about breaking away from that stuff and breaking down those things and 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 transforming in a in a more radical way. Um, so somehow, you know, you have to balance those two things in a way that is, you know, allows you to get through the process of academia, but doesn't kind of devalue the important processes of, of and work of magic that you're doing. And I mean, for me, that somehow is easier because I have a practice based PhD. So I'm not just writing like a big dissertation. I'm doing work as well. So the dissertation is a bit shorter, but you have to give a load of kind of practical work. So music and, and whatever. However, you decide to do that in doing that and not just writing about a topic kind of dryly. You're much more able to say. You know, this is how I approach this thing and this is my practice. And, and then you can get into the kind of nuts and bolts of, of magic a lot more and present it in a way where people get it because it's like artistic practice then, right? Right. <laughs> kind of couch yeah. in those terms. Um, yeah. But interestingly, there's a, when you really start to look into it, there's a ton of books that kind of equate art and music with magical stuff. Um, sure. And I mean, there's the like o obvious stuff right? Like Gurdjieff has his kind of law of octaves and how the whole universe is, is made up of, of these things. There's um, sound music. There's all the kind of, there's a lot of Renaissance music and magic crossover right. as well. But also a lot of that stuff is very systemic. The, the universe is made of vibrations. Therefore, this vibration must equal that. Or this thing must equal that. Like it becomes a, a system design for the world. And although I mean, you know, respect to the people who, who made that and put the time into that and, and, and adopted that as their belief system. It doesn't work for me because I'm more interested, as I said, like in kind of chaos and, and, mm -hmm. and anarchy and those things and the things which don't necessarily have a strict structural system. But I'm right, more kind of, yeah. yeah, and living and breathing and adapting to the circumstances. Right. I think like. Right. I, I find it really difficult to believe that the world exists to a really a kind of ordered system that we can understand somehow. Like sure. there's, the, stuff is too wild for that, and 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 you know how stuff yeah. comes out is always too too kind of strange and unexpected and uh, humorous and you know yeah. um, all of those kind of things which which lean more towards chaos and, and the kind of anarchy of those systems and the flux of them. I mean. I find it interesting in that kind of confluence of, of music and magic, the, the people who I feel like really speak to me in, in, in the terms that I understand actually are people who are really into improvisation. Yes. Um, yeah. There's a, a really good book called like a 
it's mastering the musician or something it's it but it's it's a book about how basically becoming a kind of master improviser mm -hmm. is about opening yourself up to the flow of the universe to get out of your ego um, yeah and and to get out of the way of yourself yeah. and and be prepared to fail and be prepared to kind of let something flow through you mm -hmm. which you maybe can't you know you shouldn't exercise control over sometimes you can be your own harshest yeah. critic as well right so you have to get I, I find i have to get out of my own way more yeah. more than other people's view of things sometimes i can you know really i, I work something to death um because i can't get out of my own way so uh, you yeah. sent me these beautiful tapes and i don't know if there's people in the chat that can see but um i showed them on a another patreon stream because i was just so enamored but I think I want to speak about this one specifically. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Because I think this is the one where you've actually used blood. In, yes. Right? Yeah. yeah. So can you yeah. describe how you did that? Yeah, sure. Um, so that piece of work is four kind of long, fairly free form uh, tracks, um, which were all made uh, as a result of kind of daily uh, magical practice. Mm -hmm. So for a while um, last year, every day I was trying to kind of bring improvisation into my uh, magical practice to kind of sit in front of the, the modular synth and kind of bring myself into the right headspace and make something, you know, thinking about some idea or whatever I wanted to explore. Um, and I recorded tons of those, I mean, a, a couple of months worth of every day uh, doing that and then kind of culled the, the best down um to this and and part of that is is a kind of continuation of something from the audio sigil really which is kind of looking for that um you know that spark of inspiration that arwin um from sarah's when that um kind of that you know thing that flows through you right to be present in the moment and to make something um and the interesting thing was coming back to those recordings and listening through to them and saying can i you know can I kind of extract something from this or some days that I like to, to do a release? So little of it, I remember. I was, yeah. It was really like listening to something by someone else that sounded yeah. really fresh and that I could be like, okay, I like that one or, you know, um, I'm going to pick that for, for those reasons or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but because the whole work was, was that, that it was meant, it was very much in a kind of, um, you know, magical paradigm and, and working in a specific way and, and again being kind of devoted to kind of serotonin and those ideas that I wanted to kind of do something with the packaging as well which which reflected that and I thought you know each piece is kind of unique and, and in a moment I want to at least have a, a copy of the tape per piece which is really unique as well um, which has you know uh, hand-drawn art so the what you've got one of the four which has the hand-drawn art and which has the kind of uh, this the blood in the middle of it as well um, and I thought that the kind of blood aspect of it is is important right because you're putting yourself into your work I mean that's I'm literally putting myself into the <laughs> into the yeah I, I love the, the literalism of it um, that's beautiful so I thought, you know, to, to hand draw the art in a, as a response to each piece. So like when I made the art, I listened to a specific piece and drew something in mind with that and did it once. I mean, there are no kind of redos on that. I sat down and did it and that was it. Um, and made those those covers um, with the, the silver um, on them as well. The tapes are obviously professionally duplicated. Right. Yeah. Um, and the standard editions of it, the inside and the spine is printed, um, but the front cover is stamped. So I've got yes, a, kind of gonna, a yeah. stamp um, and that stamp. But on your one, it's pen. Um, it's oh, pen and beautiful. ink um, and, and the blood. And then the uh, black packaging around the special ones, which you've got. Yeah, it's a treasure. We talk about haunting on, you know, through art and ideas. And I think about in some future where somebody stumbles onto these and like what a um, what a treasure stuff in the digital world is extremely ephemeral um mm. i mean it's very easy to like delete yeah, an audio file yeah. and, and and it's gone forever right, right. um and but i mean at the same time it's it's also kind of a fool's errand to try and sell a product these days when you're kind of a small individual uh 
kind of just trying to make stuff and not really being into promoting yourself. I mean, I yes. have a hard, hard time with being the salesman of myself. Me too. Um, yeah. And that's that's a kind of struggle again, right? That I want to make physical things. I want to make something kind of uh, real. But you know, on one hand, it's it's hard to promote that because it puts me out of my comfort zone. On the other hand, there's a lot of consumption in the world already. So how do you kind of make it in a way which is relatively kind of friendly to the the planet as well? You know, how do you do as much yourself as possible to and or know where things come from so you kind of can know that their their provenance is is somehow sustainable. Um, yeah, I mean, the, it's very difficult to balance all of that stuff. Um, but I mean, I, I want to make things which have a real, a real tangible physical thing that you can hold in your hand and look at and, you know, yeah. see the artwork for real and not on a screen. I think there's something about holding the thing in your hand, especially, you know, if it's made with with kind of intent and has some some kind of talismanic or kind of magical property. Absolutely. I, yeah. I don't want to see it on a screen. Um, so I don't yeah. like PDFs of magic books as well. There's got to be some sort of hunt with it for me to really enjoy it in a way. Yeah. You know, when it's everything's at your fingertip, it's great, but I'm I'm overwhelmed. Yeah, you know? I mean, option paralysis, right? Yeah. I mean, you can do every single thing in a computer. Yeah. So you can try everything until you you're done, right? I mean, part of the reason I got into having uh, modular synths is you can't save a preset. You know, sometimes I wire something up there and and play with it and I turn it off and next time I turn it back on, it doesn't sound the same as it did last time. I want something which is ephemeral, that I have to be in the moment, that it forces me to be like, don't overthink this, don't make, yeah. you know, do the thing, print it, move on to the next thing. And, and it's incredibly liberating to do that. Yeah. I like going back and listening to old stuff when I can't remember the process. Yeah. Because I can't, I, I can overcome my internal critic then. Because I'm not like, oh, that should have, a, I should mix that a little louder. That should be a touch more EQ oh, like yeah. this or whatever. You just kind of kill that and you hear it like you're hearing someone else's music. And then you can go. Is this good or not? You know, I've always been a discography person. I always planned for like bumps and misses, but I think the body of work speaks volumes more than these right. singular things because it's journalism, right? It's like wherever you're at yeah, uh, when Absolutely. you're creating it. Speaking of journalism, outmoded digital tethers. This track is called Pitch Black Systems, Time Wave Zero. one of those things that I made years and years ago um, and I actually thought all this music was completely lost it was made on like a PC that I had 15 years ago with like software that I don't have and old plugins and things and I was like right. there's no hope I don't even have you know high quality copies of this music anymore and I was always like I'm sad about losing this stuff because I, I did like it when I made it but it was a, a, I made it at a time of my life that was quite turbulent um, so it didn't it didn't end up getting released um, and I was just going through some CDs and stuff at my parents and they had a CD that I'd obviously made nice. of all of the tracks <laughs> in like uncompressed quality so I was like oh my god I can release this music like I'll get it That's mastered I'll, I'll sort it out
the world and technology moves so fast now. Yeah. We have to make these decisions at a speed which is faster than ever before, right? And the stuff is kind of changing under your feet all the time. So I think uh, taking the time to think about how these things fit into your praxis and how helpful they are to your, you know, health and yeah. well-being and other people's as well is, is like important work to do in the modern world. I mean, those things cause <laughs> cause internal change, which is reflected outward and, and changes the world in turn. So I think the the work is kind of always internal, but that yes. internal changes the external. And as with every great Ouroboros, what is the tail to this head, this head to this tail? What is next for Mr. Tom Whiston? I think uh, upcoming anyway is that full track of that kind of psychedelic stuff. Um, a two track thing of some kind of more experimental long form drone stuff which is all made from sounds recorded in the place I was living during the first part of the pandemic. So it's about like, you know, what is field recording when the field is the immediate space you're in? Um, and how do you kind of transmute the mundane into the extraordinary through, a, again, a kind of magical alchemical process? Um, and I'm also currently working on a small kind of scene of phys of like uh, visual art um, which I guess in a couple of months I'll be getting printed and getting out as well so, oh beautiful yeah a few things in the next next few months Tom, it has just been such a wonderful time getting to meet you face to face. I hope we keep collaborating because I'm very inspired by your work. Thanks for having me. Of course, Tom. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as I did, and it was a privilege to go back and return to the form of podcasting of which I started with this conversation with Tom. I implore you to search out Tom's music, his website, and you can find all of those in the show notes below. Also, if you haven't yet, please check out our grand We The Hallowed audio sigil Tom is a part of at wethehallowed.bandcamp.com. And if you're listening to this on February 23rd, well, it's my birthday. The music you're hearing under me is from my previously unwide released album, Bardos, that I just, well, wide released today. And you can find that at dakotaslim.bandcamp.com. It is my goal to release a edited and well-produced audio podcast at least monthly. So if you haven't yet, please subscribe to Pragmagic wherever pods are casted. 
And if you'd like to keep up to date with the uh, day-to-day and the wonderful projects and the milieu of amazing works that I am contributing or being a part of, you can subscribe to Prag Magic on YouTube and Twitch, where I do daily streams, liminal streams, have off-the-cuff interviews, and release unreleased music. Also, if you'd like to support the show financially, you can find my PayPal link for a one-time donation in the show notes, or become a Patreon at patreon.com slash pragmagic, where I shed a lot. I X, Vex, and Hex, and keep everyone in that community well into the loop, as well as running a wonderful We The Hallowed Discord, only available for patrons. I'd like to thank Mr. Tom Whiston again for an illuminating chat. And whether you're haunting on through ideas and art in the digital ether or this somatic analog atmosphere, haunt on and haunt on indeed.